Well, welcome everyone. I'm Dave Eicher. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm the editor of Astronomy Magazine. Astronomy Magazine welcomes you to this event. We hope that you'll all have a great time with it and give us a lot of feedback. I also want to welcome you on behalf of SciStarter and citizen science is a really important thing to be doing. Please check out SciStarter.org. Um, and get involved with it because it really makes a big difference. Many, many, many years ago, people used to say, well, you can contribute as an amateur, as an activist towards science. And in some ways you really couldn't. Now in this age, you really can, you can help a lot. And scientists need this help in this crazy world we live in. And they don't have the time to do everything. And you can produce data that's actually really high quality stuff that they can use. So it's important. We're very thankful that you're here. I want to welcome you. I want to remind you of a couple of ground rules before we get started and, and talk about the three exciting projects we've got today. Uh, one of them is that you're muted in this as a, as a viewer in this broadcast, but you can post questions in chat. So be sure to share your questions with all the presenters and the participants, please, as you post. You can also stream the live event, we believe. We were just fiddling with a bit of this technology in our, in our glorious isolation we're in now. And we think we have it all set so that you can stream the live event to your own Facebook pages by going to not astronomy magazines, Caroline, please help me if, if you can, uh, but to SciStarter's Facebook page and it's streaming so to a co-hosted event, so I'll drop the link in the chat for everybody. Very Let good. It. Yeah. Very good. Okay, so there'll be a link in the chat uh, in which you can come in, select uh, share and select under share, I believe, start a watch party and you can spread the joy of doing citizen science, which is really more important than it ever has been in our world. All of the projects that we're featuring here today, they can all be found at SciStarter.org slash astronomy mag. So we'd like to ask that you check out that page uh, if you can. Uh, I also encourage you to sign up for projects so that you can get involved during this live event. And we wanna hear feedback from you. We're gonna have some polls, uh, Q and A I think is enabled and you can uh, post things onto chat. So we'll be, we'll be watching uh, with, with great interest what you post and how you interact with us today. We'd like to start with a poll, in fact, if we can, and that is we'd like to ask you, have you ever heard of citizen science before? And, or have you participated in any citizen science project quickly? Please let us know what your familiarity with citizen science is and have you actually participated in a citizen science project up until this point in history? We'd love to hear that. Uh, and I think we can see the results of polls as we go. Let us know what, what you think there. And we'll let that go for a little while. And as we're getting started with that, um, I want to briefly mention uh, who the, ah, there we go. We've got, we've got uh, poll results already, lots of them. Thank you for participating. That's wonderful. Uh, and please continue to participate in these polls and let us know if you have questions and feedback. This is really what it is all about, doing this kind of an event, which uh, really is more important now than ever in, in this crazy situation that we're all in on our little planet. I'll more fully introduce our three projects and our panelists. We're going to get to uh, one by one as we get into it, but just quickly, if you could say hello to each of you, uh, because you know I'm Dave, but we also have with us the three important people today, and they're our scientists, our project scientists. Connie Walker is going to be a very, very important aspect of astronomy that is a an increasing uh, dilemma for us, of course, those of us who love the night sky, light pollution. Connie, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well. How are you today, David? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for joining us. And, and we're going to hear, Connie's going to go first, so we're going to hear a lot from Connie shortly here, uh, momentarily. We also have an old friend of, of the magazine of ours, 
with us today, Stan Odenwald. How are you, Stan? I'm just fine, thank you. It's great to see you. You're going to talk about another uh, serious issue that we have going on in observational astronomy, and that is satellite tracking. And we've got, of course, an increasing, uh, increasingly worrisome situation with some satellites, uh, particularly when it comes to astrophotographers in this hobby of ours. Uh, we also have with us Patrick Treithart. Patrick, uh, I don't believe I've talked to you to meet you, though. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks a lot. You, you're doing okay, Patrick? Yeah, yeah, doing good. <laughs> Excellent. And Patrick is going to talk uh, about something that's very near and dear to my heart, and that is the classification of spiral galaxies, a really neat project. All of these projects are really cool that you can get involved with. So without further ado, uh, Connie, let's get into yours. Connie Walker is an astronomer known around the world for her advocacy of dark skies education. She's been a scientist at the National Science Foundation's National Optical Infrared Astronomy Research Laboratory, or as she reminded us yesterday, the NOIR Lab, which has nothing to do with Alfred Hitchcock, uh, <laughs> but it's now the acronym is the NOIR Lab. Uh, basically your national observatory. She says she's been there for almost 20 years. And, and this is, of course, for the vast majority of people on Earth, a major uh, problem and challenge for us now with, with enjoying the night skies and, and our uh, both professional science and our, our hobby enjoyment, because it used to be a couple of centuries ago that everyone had a great dark sky, and now we don't have that anymore. So yeah, Connie, sure. if you're willing to tell us a little bit about your exciting project in which people can help out with analyzing light pollution. Well, since it's my passion, I would love to. Could you stop sharing the screen so I could share mine? Am I sharing the screen? Oh, somebody, doing, somebody was. Yeah. was. I was, yeah. Uh, now it's, <laughs> Connie, you're on. It's uh, your turn to share. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm getting to that point now. And can everyone see the screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. I'm putting it in presenter mode and here we go. Okay, I am a fanatic when it comes to astronomy. I've been a fanatic for centuries, it's, well, it's not centuries, but decades. <laughs> and you can see, for instance, on this slide here, this absolutely enormously gorgeous view of the night sky, which really you can't see naked eye, but you can see with the camera it's taken by uh, Bob Ector Freshy, a world-renowned photographer in uh, astronomy and photography. And, uh, and I, I felt this way. Uh, so if I get too overzealous, please forgive me. It's my passion. Uh, I felt this way since I was a child, about 10 years old. We had the Apollo 8 uh, actually uh, orbit the moon and take this incredible uh, Earthrise picture. And no one until that point had ever, ever, ever seen the view of the earth from outside, from another basically heavenly body. And it was so inspirational. And of course you had Star Trek, the first series of Star Trek, and that just launched my career from that point on. And I live now in, in Tucson, Arizona, where there is the National Observatory. And at the outskirts of town, almost every night you can see a night sky like this one in the lower left-hand side of your screen. Very, very inspirational to this day. So as you can see in slide three, I think it is now, um, uh, this is a gorgeous night sky taken in a, for a contest, for a photo contest. And it is, again, it, it just makes you in awe of the beauty of the night sky. If you could for a moment, just close your eyes and imagine the most beautiful place you've ever been where you've had you know, so many stars, you couldn't even count them, okay? And, and to know now that if you open your eyes and you look at the fourth screen here, we have um, still that beautiful night sky, but it's, it's, a, it's covered, washed out by city lights. And if you were at this point inside that city, imagine yourself inside that city looking up, what, it is, what is it you think you would see? And this is uh, the first poll, I think, whoever has the poll command. <laughs> <laughs> so would you see a beautiful night sky? I think that's one of your choices with the um, Milky Way arching overhead. Would you see um, that a little bit reduced and sort of faded out? Or would you see, what was the third choice? I forgot. <laughs> um, I don't have... Everyone answer what you think you would see in the chat. Hmm. 
give us some feedback in the chat and we'll be monitoring it there. Okay. okay. So anyways, I, I'm gonna probably give away the answer because I know you, you all probably want me to continue here. Um, this is a view 20 years after the advent of the streetlights. Just imagine two decades, that's it. And this is Los Angeles in uh, 1908. Just imagine that. And that same vantage point from Mount Wilson, another picture was taken 80 years later. So you have the same size scale here, but look at the growth of the population and the impact that the lighting has had. And the night sky, well, Mount Wilson Observatory isn't very functional these days, let's just say. So imagine what that has done. Now we look at it globally, not just from a city or a country, but globally, what kind of effect that, that light pollution has had. And it's as if in this picture, you have taken the stars from the heavens and, and thrown them down onto the earth so you have urban constellations, basically. You can de decipher where the cities are, right? And I think there's another poll right now. <laughs> are you able to do the polls? I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, I'm manning some issues on the Facebook page. So um, everyone, please answer in the chat uh, Connie's yeah. question. Can you tell where the countries are? <laughs> but more importantly, actually, the question I wanted to ask at this point, right before this next slide was, what kind of impact do you know that light pollution causes? We've already talked about what it causes in terms of your viewing the night sky, how it washes out the night sky. And it, we already talked a little bit about how it affects astronomical research, but there are other impacts that are closer to your life that it, it, it affects. So can anyone in the, in the chat come up with, and I am trying to get the chat going here, and I'm sorry, I can't even see the chat. Uh, don't um, worry. Connie, I'm monitoring it for you. People are saying <laughs> they love driving the rural roads in Ohio at night because so much more can be seen. Uh-huh. What kind of answers, other answers do you have? Someone said confuses baby turtles. <gasps> there you go. That's one of the huge points. I mean, uh, you have the glare, like you said, from, from, the, from the lights of a car. You have uh, the baby sea turtles being confused. That is a huge issue. Uh, that is one that's very endearing to my heart, especially. Um, and what are some other ones you might think of? Someone said, confuses migrating birds, window collisions? Oh, I love these answers. That's perfectly right. That's perfectly right. So as you can see in this slide here, um, it actually also in, in, uh, impacts energy the, because it's wasted energy. If you are not directing that light downward, you're wasting it by directing it upward. And all that wasted energy is just, you know, wasted. <laughs> uh, and there's issues actually with cost related to that energy consumption. There's also issues with, um, uh, if you're like a, a robber and you want to steal a car from there, there's so much glare, you have a better chance. So there's safety issues too, in terms of, of that. Um, but what is also important, I think, is how it disrupts your circadian rhythm. So health issues for humans. And it, it, it causes sleep deprivation. You're not awake to function the next day. Um, it, but yeah, and that's tied to different diseases, uh, actually. Uh, your melatonin levels are, are supposed to be repleted at night when you don't have constantly uh, a lot of light at night. We're diurnal, uh, diurnal animals. We're supposed to get that sleep and not have as much light. So that by having not as much light, you know, total darkness, you are repleting your melatonin levels and that blocks things like um, cancer cells from developing and things like that. So there's all sorts of issues to um, obesity, ties to diabetes, lots of things. So here we have a polling issue. Have you heard of citizen science? It's already in guys. <laughs> uh, most of you, 84% have heard, that's pretty high. That's, I don't know why that came up here, but it did. Um, but the fourth thing that really is incredible is what you've already touched on a few of you, which was the effect on wildlife. They cannot speak for themselves. You have to speak for them. And there's so many effects that, uh, on wildlife. Uh, like you said, the sea turtles are disoriented because they get attracted by the lights on shore instead of the starlight glistening off of the ocean. And so they, they go the wrong way. You have the migrating birds that uh, see the lights in the building and they think it's sunset. They go head towards that circle around. Either they, they, they uh, are affected by exhaustion or they actually collide with the windows. And there's a million birds each year in the US that die this way. It's kind of unfortunate. So lots of things for animals and insects that are affected by uh, high levels of light pollution. 
So here you have uh, Kitt Peak. Uh, this is a nearby observatory for, to where I live in Tucson. It's 65 miles away, but you can still see the effects from Tucson glowing, even though we have strict lighting laws. But this is what I'm trying to say here. It's a, it's a global issue, but you can have local solutions and everybody can take part because this is one type of pollution that is easily fixed in your own home even. So, and what I'm talking about, I'm gonna give away the punchline because I think I already, actually I bypassed another poll, but that's okay. Um, this is obviously an, easy, an answer that most of you would have thought of, and I'm sorry, I should have made it a poll, but, um, but it's, it's shielding your lights. You normally don't have the option to, to turn your lights off. You must leave them on. So what can you do basically is the question to leave them on, but have a light go down and not up. And actually the poll asked, added another line, you want to see the source, not the source of the light, but you want to see actually the effect on the ground, right? So for instance, instead of having the scene on the left-hand side of this picture, you end up having the scene on the right-hand side because you are simply shielding. It takes away the glare, it takes away the trespass into your home of the light, it takes away the um, inability to see a starry night sky. It's a win-win-win situation. So that was the, the best solution you could possibly do just as a homeowner yourself. But the other thing you can do to help reduce light pollution is to actually take data that can be used uh, in various ways I'll explain in a moment. And this is, unfortunately, I was kind of silly. This is the only page on which I had put the link to Globe at Night. Uh, this is, uh, you can also go through SciStarter.org, but if you want a direct link, which SciStarter gives you on our Globe at Night page, as well. This is the link to our website at globeatnight.org. This is a citizen science program. And that means, as you all know, that you can be basically scientists for the evening and, and or as long as you want and take data that's actually used tremendously because astronomers cannot be everywhere and all things to all people. They, they take their whole lifetime to get this data set. So we need your input in order to monitor situations of light pollution all around the world. And it's so, so, so easy to do. You do need to actually take 15 minutes to get dark adapted way after sunset, like an hour after sunset, you go outside, it's dark, and you, you just let your eyes adjust okay, to the darkness. Because if you can do that, then your data is much more accurate. And it takes like 30 seconds to take the data. <laughs> so most of the time is spent simply getting dark adapted. And who can do this? Anyone from ages, I would say eight and up and anywhere in the world. And there's 10 special days each month and they differ every month because the moon phase differs and you wanna avoid the moon. And of course for students, we usually pick the first half of the night. So we have these 10 magical days between uh, what they would call third quarter phase of the moon and new moon where, um, where you can go out and take this data. Um, so this is some instances for which that we've had such fantastic promotion uh, that has gone viral, basically. It was in the media and, and uh, it was just amazing. We had this National Geographic event called Bio Blitz. They pick um, each year a national park and this, and one year it was in Tucson. On the east and west sides, we have national parks and we had the amateur astronomers and the general public take data on four major streets across Tucson, east and west. And then on the east and west side, we had the national parks where the Boy Scouts were in one park and the park Park ranges and the other, and they took data and they found that the center of Tucson, which is, I don't know if you can see my cursor right here, uh, it was 100 times brighter than the darkest point on the west, on the eastern edge of one of the mountain ranges there in one of the parks. So that was incredible promotional, great awareness, uh, means of awareness. And another one was, again, amateur astronomers and high school students in Norman, Oklahoma, doing a lighting inventory, bringing it to their city council and getting their laws changed. Now, how dramatic, how more dramatic can you be than that? That was outstanding, right? And then we have students in colleges taking data for us, you know, like every minute, every night for a year, it was automated. And, and comparing that in, from the center of the city to the outskirts of the city and to the observatories that were 50, 60 miles away, right? 
Um, and the, the darker the sky you have, the higher this curve is going to be. So you can compare these two curves are on the same scale. And you can see that, and this is the different seasons, you can see how things change and how it's important to know when, when and how things change in order to, you know, try to make a difference if you need to. So that was an enormously incredible study. But the one I really liked was a study of 13 bats that went across from their, feed, their resting area to their feeding area 25 kilometers away every night. And we followed them. Uh, this is the Arizona Game and Fish with a bunch of our students. And they took you know, loads and loads of data to compare their route to um, how they avoided city center uh, and the light pollution at city center. And you can see the contour map there. And uh, they wanted to know, the Arizona Game of Fish wanted to know whether we needed to strengthen our lighting laws. It turns out that it's one of three factors and they didn't feel that that was enough to actually, for, for Tucson, enough to actually change the lighting laws. So this data can be used, what I'm trying to say, in a variety of ways. How do you take that data? So simple. You're not counting stars. I have to say this, okay? Please don't count stars. For people in national parks, you'll be there all night. So, but, but for people in, in, in the cities, uh, we, a little bit too simple. So let's look at the national park. And this is for the constellation last month. I apologize. This month is Leo. Last month, it was the fabulous constellation of Orion. And, um, and this is like what you would see in the national park. You have so many stars. If the stars in, in Orion were not as bright, you wouldn't see it basically against the background stars. But so you're just kind of looking for the faintest star and comparing it to seven maps I'll show you in just the next, you know, next slide or so. Um, and so the map you choose is what you actually see in the night sky. So that's the point. The map you choose is the closest the resemblance to what you see visually in the night sky. So this would be like New York City. So that same map I just showed you would get obliterated by light pollution, basically, and you'd only see the brightest stars, not the faintest stars, okay? And then lastly, this is another one that's sort of in between where you see from most uh, medium-sized cities like, like Tucson, okay? So that's pretty much all you have to do is choose one of these seven maps, very, very simple, and, um, and that's, your that's your data, basically. And how you do this, I'll show you in a moment, but I'll give you an overview right now. You are gonna answer just a few questions, that's it. If you have a smartphone, the first question of when you make the observations and where you make the observations are gonna be automatically entered onto your phone and you don't need to do a thing. But if you don't, you can easily answer uh, those questions uh, in just a second. Uh, and the third question here is where you're gonna input your data and you're gonna see by touching these little thumbnails on the bottom, it's gonna make it a bigger picture here and you choose which one most resembles your night sky. And the fourth one here is just your, it, your choosing your weather, basically. If, is it clear or is it overcast? And I, I hope you don't choose the last one. If you take data at that time, that data will not really be useful to us, I'm sorry to say. For you amateur astronomers out there, if you have a sky quality meter, and I'll show you that in a second, you have a place to put in the data on in number five, but let me tell you, you don't need to do it if you don't have it, it's optional. This is a sky quality meter very briefly. This is about the, the size of a pack of cards. As long as uh, this sensor is upwards <laughs> and not down, and, and you press, you know, you hold it overhead, you press the start button, you get a reading. The, lot, the bigger the number, the darker the sky. And sometimes if it's, it's a really dark sky, it'll take a long time to, to integrate. So it'll go beep, 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 and keep beeping. That's a good sign, I'll tell you. These are our dates. Uh, the next one, as you can see, the campaign is starting on April 14th. I hope you'll join us. And let me just show you quickly our website. And I don't know if I, have to, can you see that website or not? Do I have to share that? Um, we can see it. Oh, wonderful. So here's our website. Um, <clears throat> the report page, you just click on report. It comes up and you can put it on night version if you'd like to. So that doesn't uh, destroy your, your night adaptation, your vision at night. And you can put on uh, allow local access. And that usually, I guess I did it too late. It, uh, usually it puts your time and date, which is right now. Oh, um, you're still in presenter mode for, mode for PowerPoint. So if you click the hyperlink, it should take you to the website. If I, I did do that. Oh, okay, so maybe exit presenter mode. Okay. Oh, sorry. No worries. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, and then can you see it? Mm, do I have to uh, re enter? Um, just share your screen. 
Okay. Like that. Um, click share screen at the bottom of the Zoom window, the green box. Yeah, I know what it does when it gets me in this mode is it, it doesn't let me get out. That's the thing. So I'm gonna end this show. And let me see if I can get back into your, your mode again. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I was asking earlier, but let me get to the website um, and share that for just briefly. Um, and you can see here's the report page. You see that now? Yep, we can see it. Thank you. Thanks. I'm, I'm sorry about that. And you can see that you allow access if you want to, uh, and then put the date and time in there. And you could put, if you don't want your street address in here, put the next nearest corner from where you're taking your measurement. So if I put, if I'm at my work location, put in 950 North Cherry Ave and Tucson, AZ, USA. You don't have to put the country usually, but it goes there. Boom, you're there. And then you just pick the, um, the, um, oops, sorry. You just pick what um, map you'd like to choose. I would say that it's closest to number four. And you can see here, notice that Leo has this wonderful backwards question mark. That's what I wanted to show you. And this backwards question mark is going to be somewhere between the east and the southeast during like 8.30 at night, uh, during uh, the early part of the week on the, on the, after, after the 14th. And uh, you'll also see a little triangle back here. Um, and that's, uh, that's the, <clears throat> no, the, the back end of the, um, the, the, the lion. And, uh, and that's mainly what, what the constellation is for those of you who have never found Leo before. Uh, and just pick, you, you can do like, you know, the national park, if you're in a national park, that's what it looks like. If you're in a, in a city, that's what it looks like. But for most places, it's somewhere around four. Um, and then you just pick your weather and you are done unless you have a sky quality meter. So for me, it's been extremely clear every night uh, in Tucson, it usually is. You don't have to do these uh, location comments and sky condition comments if you don't want to. And if you don't have a sky quality meter, you don't need to do that. I want you to notice something very important down here before you submit the data. If you have, as it says here, a size starter account and would like to earn credit for your contribution to Globe at Night, please enter the email you used to create your size starter account. And that's where you would do it and then submit the data and you are done. See how easy that was? And it really helps. It really makes a difference. And I want to thank you once again. Um, I will stop sharing the screen. And I think it's it successfully fantastic. stopped. Thank you so much, Connie. You know, Tucson, where you are and where I hope to end up, and Flagstaff have both done so much in terms of success with light pollution and controlling it with ordinances. Is there anything that we can learn from Tucson and Flagstaff that could be uh, applied to other localities? Yes, we recently actually did a um, retrofit. And we and what's happening to lights is that you can no longer get um, low pressure sodium lights, so you have to actually use uh, LED lights. And you have to know what types of LED lights to use. That is the ones that they say are more warmer, which is just totally opposite what you would think of. And they have um, a more reddish and yellowish color than the uh, cooler lights that are um, more intense and not as, to a lot of people, not as natural. So um, that there, you wanna get more energy efficient lights, not maybe have as many out there. And, uh, and what we did uh, in, in, go, in going that way for Tucson is actually lower by at least uh, 7%, 10%, the uh, amount of light that's being emitted from the city. So the other cities can do such things if they want to. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Connie. And let us know, uh, I'm not seeing the chat at the moment here myself. It went somewhere, but let us know with Q&A or with chat. If you have feedback, if you have questions, if you have comments, please let us see them. And, and what a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Connie, so much. Well, my pleasure. Thank you for letting me do that. Sten Odenwald, a name that is familiar to astronomy magazines. Sten is an award-winning astrophysicist and a prolific science popularizer. You know that. He's currently the director of citizen science for the NASA Space Science Education Consortium at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Sten, today you're going to tell us a bit about one project of yours that is Satellite Streak Watcher, which is becoming, uh, shall we say, increasingly important. Uh, rapidly in this day and age. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, that's uh, that's absolutely correct. Um, 
let's see if I have the uh, the PowerPoint slides here, I can actually start talking to them. But uh, meanwhile, um, when I started out in, as a, as a, an amateur astronomer in my teenage years, you know, it was kind of a novelty to have, uh, you know, while you're photographing the constellations and things with your homemade telescope, you know, every once in a while you'd look up in the sky, uh, you know, an hour after twilight, and you'd see this uh, the satellite going across the sky, and it would just be quite quite amazing. Um, you know, it's the dawn of the space age, and we're just starting to put satellites up, and wow, there is a piece of human technology going across the sky in the twilight just after sunset. You know, how great is that? You know, um, and meanwhile, you know, you sort of continue being an amateur astronomer, you know, taking photographs and learning uh, the techniques of astrophotography and, you know, buying your cameras at the flea market and putting them on your telescope and trying to take the ultimate photograph of the Orion Nebula or some deep sky object, you know, for your own personal satisfaction. And, you know, there are those satellites up in the sky, you know, and uh, there weren't that many of them, so you didn't really pay them much attention. But what has now happened is that, uh, you know, since low Earth orbit has become so enormously commercialized and is prime real estate for defense satellites and things like that, um, well, let me say at this point, I really do need the PowerPoint since I'm starting to talk about, yeah, yeah there's um, one. Your slides are, uh, um, so just let me know when you want to go to the next slide. I'm yes. currently hanging them so everyone can see. Okay, fine. Uh, let's go to the next slide. This is, this is what low Earth orbit looks like uh, very crudely. <laughs> uh, that's, that's the uh, uh, orbits between about 120 kilometers above the surface of the Earth up to about 500 to 600 kilometers. And of course, that's the stomping ground of the International Space Station and a whole host of satellites. Well, you know, even as these are going up in the sky, you know, and uh, being used commercially, you know, as an astronomer, you know, you didn't really pay them too much attention because, you know, you knew where they were, you knew that their orbits, you know, what, what they were, and you could calculate uh, for any given time, you know, when they would be streaking across the sky. And, you know, you'd make allowances for that. If you look at the next slide, uh, the early constellation satellites, one of them was the Iridium constellation. And, uh, uh, some some people began to notice that you know when the sun reflected off of these solar panels at just the right angle, uh, you would get these flashes in the sky. And if we look at the next slide, uh, this is what a an iridium flare looks like, and they would be happening about once every night from just about any given location that you happen to be on on, on the planet Earth. Uh, you could actually figure out when one of these would occur by going to services like uh, heavensabove.com, and they would give you for your latitude, longitude, and, and day, you know, when the next flare would happen. So if you were, <laughs> if you were a photographer or a very bored amateur astronomer, you know, you'd get your camera tripod out and your digital single lens reflex camera, and you'd wait for that flare, and boom, there it would be. I. Uh, well, okay, so that was kind of fun because you'd only have one of these, you know, bright, obnoxious flares maybe every every night or so, and you could still do a lot of fun astronomy, you know, as an amateur and also as a professional. Uh, next slide. Uh, then, of course, you know, when the International Space Station went up, you know, oh, this was a great target of opportunity. Uh, on the left is what you would see if you were in space approaching it, you know, for docking. But that figure that you see on the right is a photograph of the International Space Station taken with a 10-inch amateur-built telescope on the ground. <laughs> and the way you do that is you take your smartphone, put it in video mode, slap it up against your eyepiece, and wait for the streak, the, the, the space station, to come through your eyepiece field of view. And once again, you, you use services like uh, heavensabove.com to figure out the exact timing and the exact pointing direction and things like that. And it's now a great sport for amateur astrophotographers to try to take the definitive picture of the International Space Station at high resolution from the ground using the smallest aperture telescope <laughs> they can use, including a pair of binoculars. <laughs> 
So, okay, that's fine. You know, if you're an amateur astronomer, it's, it's kind of cool. It's a great sport. Uh, if you're a professional astronomer, no big problem because you know exactly what the trajectory and the orbit of the space station is. So you could just make sure that when you're taking a photograph using a big honking telescope on the ground, you don't point it at the orbit across your sky of the space station and start exposing your, your camera at the time when it's going to be transiting your field of view because that'll ruin your photograph. Uh, the next uh, PowerPoint slide uh, shows uh, International Space Station streak across the, the twilight sky. These are fairly bright. And in fact, they can be brighter than the planet Venus uh, on certain occasions. If you get the sun angle just right and the season of the year right and your shoe size correct and all these <laughs> other particulars. But again, you know, it's great sport. You know, you, you use heavens above, find out what the next transit across your sky is gonna be, set up your camera tripod and your digital camera, put it on manual mode, you know, yada, 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 and boom, you get these fun photographs of the space station streaking across the sky. And you also capture a couple of stars. Here's the constellation Orion on the, on the right there. So, you know, great fun. Uh, the next slide. Now we're sort of in a different frame of mind now. Um, you know, everybody loves the internet. Uh, SpaceX has decided that everybody on planet Earth has to have instant access to Facebook. So therefore, the solution is you put 10 to 20,000 satellites in low Earth orbit as a mega constellation. SpaceX is not the only company planning on doing this. Uh, AT&T and a couple of others already have in plans 5,000 satellite constellations in low Earth orbit and so forth and so on. Uh, this isn't a concept for the distant future. This is happening right now. SpaceX has started to launch 60 at a time every week, uh, SpaceX or, or Starlink satellites into orbits uh, that are basically, you know, in the mid latitudes and cover, you know, all of the, the populated areas of the earth uh, to one degree or another. Um, these satellites are kind of small. So that has the one thing going for them. Uh, next picture. This is, however, what they look like when they go across the sky. Uh, when they are first injected into orbit, uh, they're all in the same orbit and they're ejected from their carrier, you know, one at a time. So they basically look like pearls on a string and they go across the sky in, you know, about half hour to an hour after sunset or sunrise. And they are the creepiest looking things you will ever see in your life as an amateur astronomer or an astronomer. We don't ever see geometrically perfect things like this going across the sky in unison at basically a very, very fast pace. They cover from horizon to horizon in about 15 seconds. They are hustling <laughs> and they are very bright. Uh, when they are first put into orbit, uh, they can be almost as bright as the planet Venus. When they finally get placed into their, their final orbit configurations and planes, they're somewhat thinner. Uh, they go down to about fifth magnitude. But still, fifth magnitude is within the naked eye visibility range. So this means that SpaceX Starlink satellites are always going to be visible to humans from the surface of the Earth and it doesn't have to be dark sky conditions. You can see this in urban light polluted areas as well. In fact, sometimes they are, you can see the Starlink satellites better than you can see the, sat the, the stars in the constellation Orion. Uh, the next picture, this is now what happens when you have lots of these satellites in low earth orbit going across the sky. You're a professional astronomer uh, who's using a billion dollar telescope complex to do a deep exposure, deep integration on a small piece of the sky because you're searching for the infant galaxies that first formed in the universe. So these are long time exposure photographs that take hours and hours and hours. Um, and the problem with the Starlink satellites and the new satellites about to be put into low earth orbit 
is that there are so many of them that there are going to be almost no places in the twilight early evening sky that you can point your telescope and not have something that looks like this for a portion of your exposure. Now, you can be very clever. I mean, you can consult as an astronomer the ephemeris of when these trains of satellites are going to pass through your particular observing field. Uh, and on, in some circumstances, you can even correct your image for these streaks. But the problem is when they get to be so numerous, eventually 10, 20, 30% of your photographic field is taken up by correcting for these streaks, which means dropping out the pixels and other things like that. I, I wanna point out that, that for a deep exposure photograph, like the ones that were used with the Polymer Observatory Sky Survey, uh, those were multi-hour photographs and they reached uh, 20th magnitude, 20th visual magnitude. Starlink satellites uh, can be as bright as fifth magnitude, so that's 15 magnitudes, that's a million. These Starlink satellites are a million times brighter than the faint stars you're trying to study in these photographic fields. I mean, that's, it, it's bonkers. Well, anyway, the next photograph, uh, yeah, the next slide, uh, shows an amateur photograph of uh, M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. I mean, this amateur spends a lot of time trying to set up the photograph correctly using the camera and using stacking and filtering and calibration techniques. You know, the time exposure is on the order of, uh, you know, 20 minutes to 30 minutes. And, and this is what happens. You know, you're trying to photograph the perfect picture of this galaxy and all of a sudden this armada of satellites starts streaking through the field. And it's not like these satellites in this photograph are particularly bright. They're only about fifth magnitude in this field. And uh, so that means that amateurs trying to photograph uncluttered star fields are, are going to be beset with this sort of a problem for the foreseeable future. And now things get worse because in the next slide, uh, well, okay, this actually looks pretty. <laughs> this is actually a drop dead gorgeous picture. And it's bizarre because you've got the Starlink satellite streaks, which are geometrically perfect lines and this wonderful you know, Orion constellation on the left, and you have the streaks going through the Pleiades uh, just above the treetop there, you know, and you can see the, uh, the Hyades star cluster and um, uh, Aldebaran just below the streaks. Gorgeous picture, and if you're intending to photograph something like this because you think you know, humanity's technological touch to the night sky is something that you would like to have a big photograph of for your den and go for it. This is what you're gonna get all the time. But if you're an amateur that wanted a large field photograph of the Milky Way to look at dust clouds and things like that, which is now currently a popular thing to do, you're gonna have these streaks in your field that in this case, they basically trashed your photograph of the Pleiades at the same time you're trying to look at the emission nebula around the Pleiades cluster or dark clouds surrounding the whole ensemble. So, you know, it's going to limit the kinds of fun projects that amateur astronomers can do. And it certainly limits, because of the complexity of correcting for these things, what professional astronomers can do. Uh, the next photograph, the next slide, uh, shows another kind of a photo. You know, you take uh, your camera, you, you leave, leave the shutter open for a couple of hours, and you get these star trail photos that show, you know, the diurnal motion of the Earth and how the stars get stretched into these beautiful arcs. Well, there's a whole cottage industry of photographers that love shooting these kinds of photographs in incredibly bizarre places. And here you have Starlink satellites, too. <laughs> Did you want to have Starlink satellites in this? Field, no, but you get them free of charge and it's really hard to set up a three hour photograph or a five hour photograph, you know, that avoids these things entirely. Uh, the next slide, uh, here's just another example. I mean, I think at this point you kind of get the picture. Uh, here's the, uh, another photograph in the next slide. Beautiful picture. This amateur was just absolutely delighted to get this beautiful portrait of the Orion Nebula, you know, complicated setup, stacking and calibration and dark, dark field subtraction and bias subtraction. 
and he gets Starlink satellites. <laughs> uh, so this is this has become commonplace, not only for amateur astronomers, but, but now for professional astronomers. Uh, the next slide. Oh, okay, we're already at the end. Well, go back to the previous slide. <laughs> uh, what, uh, what I decided to do is uh, I, I became interested in this whole idea of uh, satellite streaks. And because I'm also interested in finding clever uses for smartphones uh, as part of my NASA education activities, because they're mobile data gathering platforms that everybody has, I kind of put two and two together and decided that, hey, is there some way that you could put a smartphone on a camera tripod and photograph these uh, Starlink satellite streets? And of course, the answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, you can do that pretty easily. Uh, some of the modern smartphone cameras uh, produce the most amazing photographs of the Milky Way that you've ever seen in your life. They're just absolutely incredible. And they are perfect devices for recording these kinds of streaks as well. So I decided to create a, a, a citizen science project where I'm asking people uh, to get out their digital single lens reflex cameras, their Nikons, their Pentaxes, whatever they have, uh, put them on a tripod, uh, go to heavensabove.com, uh, find out when the next satellites are going to be streaking across your sky, and then go out there and photograph them. And after you've done the photo, uh, upload that photograph to the uh, uh, Satellite Streak Watcher uh, project, which you can get to from uh, scistarter.org. Uh, or what you can do is, uh, you can open up your smartphone store and download the app called Anic Data. That's A-N-E-C-D-A-T-A. -A. Uh, you open up that app and you register to become a member of the Anic Data community. And then you can select among the 300 projects, citizen science projects, the one called uh, Satellite Streak Watcher. Uh, what you then do is upload that photograph that you took, either with your smartphone or with your digital camera, uh, to the observation page on that project, uh, indicate what the constellation was that you were pointing at, uh, and the data page does the rest. It, it basically records what camera model you were using, uh, what your latitude longitude was, uh, your time of day, uh, your blood type, and your hat size. I'm sorry, it doesn't do that. Um, and all of this information can now be put together not only into a gallery of images that you can observe, you can look through yourself, but also it produces a GIS geographic map of all of the observations that were made uh, by people in that project. And you can, it, it's projected on the world, so you can see contributions by people in, in India or the Midwest or California or Alaska or what have you. Uh, currently, there are about, uh, oh, 250 or so members, uh, and they've contributed something like about 40 images so far. Many of them are, are absolutely stunning. Um, and we're looking for more of these photos because the idea is that we want to create an archive, a historic archive, uh, for literally the degradation of the night sky as more of these satellites get put into the sky and the various ways that the sky has been corrupted. And so that basically the presentation. I hope you will join the program and thank you very much. Thank you, Stan. And Connie and Stan have both shown us here that we have a lot of work to do in citizen science and in science overall to make a better future for the night sky so that people will know about astronomy. The only science that you can really literally share the same laboratory as amateurs and professionals. We've got some challenges ahead to, to make uh, some improvements we hope in the future here. And these are important projects to try to do that. Patrick Troithart is going to tell us about something that's a little bit different now. And I'm a galaxy guy, so I really like this. This Patrick, let me just tell you about Patrick. First of all, Patrick is the assistant head at the Astronomy and Astrophysics Research Lab at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. His work deals with understanding the evolution of nearby galaxies by studying their different forms. Patrick is going to tell us about a project called Spiralgraph, in which you can help 
uh, to classify spiral galaxies and their morphological types, which is very exciting, and especially for a galaxy guy. So thank you, Patrick, so much for doing this. We'll shift gears into the distant universe now. And Patrick, take it away. Yeah, well, thanks. Thanks for having me to talk about this. Uh, yeah, so I'm pretty excited about this project. So let me, let me share my screen here. And let's see if you can see the presentation. All right, so yeah, so the, the project is called Spiral Graph. Uh, and what it is, it's basically a project to measure the winding of spiral arms in spiral galaxies. Um, and so let me, let me just, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you just a brief overview and a little bit of background about it. But mainly what I wanna do is actually take you to the project and show you how it works and just kinda do, just kinda get hands on with it and show you how it works to begin with. Um, so, so broadly, the, the main thing is, is that there are two types of gap, two main types of galaxies in the observable universe. There are, there are these types called ellipticals uh, that basically look like hoagie buns. So they're, they're just kind of giant balls of stars. And if you could imagine taking one and just rotating it in any direction, it would just basically look the same. There's no real structure to them. They're just very kind of smooth, uh, bright balls of light. Uh, and though, to me, those are kind of boring. So I'm, I'm more into spiral galaxies myself. So if you look at the Hubble tuning fork here on the, on the right side, you see that they're, they're spiral galaxies. And again, these, these look like pinwheels, right? They, have a, they tend to have like a bulge in the center and then spiral arms coming out of the bulge. Uh, and so we see that in, the, in this case, but there are also another type of galaxy, type of spiral called barred spirals, where you tend to have a bulge and then a linear structure running through the bulge and then arms coming off the ends of the linear structure. And we call those barred spiral galaxies. Uh, but the interesting thing is that uh, these spiral galaxies, they have different arm windings. So you can see here on, the, on the, the side closest to the intersection here, you can see that all these arms are more tightly wrapped than as you move further away in this classification scheme. So the wrapping of the arms actually tells you things about the spiral galaxy that's not really easy to measure. Um, and so one of these things is that there's a, there seems to be a relationship between how tightly wound the arms are and the mass of the supermassive black hole found in the nucleus of each spiral galaxy. So the more tightly wound the arms are, the higher the mass of the supermassive black hole found in the nucleus. And that's just a, and if you know, this, this relationship makes it a very easy way to, to estimate supermassive black hole mass in the nucleus of galaxies. So really all you have to do is you just measure how tightly wound the arms are and you read it off this plot and it tells you the mass of the supermassive black hole in the center, or it gives you an approximation gives you a pretty good approximation. So generally what we find is that when we, when we do this, when we, when we look at black holes in the centers of galaxies, in the nuclei of galaxies, we find that they all tend to be what we call supermassive black holes. So they all tend to lie on this region of this, of this plot. And these are black holes that range from millions to, to billions of times the mass of the sun. Uh, and we, we tend to find these a lot. The issue is, is that the, the, the interesting thing about this is that we don't know how these galaxies form supermassive black holes because we see these things forming very early in the universe, basically right alongside as galaxies form. And it's not clear how these galaxies can form such large black holes in their nuclei so quickly. Um, and so one, uh, one thing to look for is something called intermediate mass black holes. And these are black holes that range from thousands to hundreds of thousands of times the mass of the sun. And these are very rare. There, there are maybe a dozen candidates and maybe, you know, I'd say a handful, let's say five uh, actually confirmed intermediate mass black holes. Uh, and so the issue is, is so what we think is, is that uh, it, very early, very early in galaxies formation is that potentially uh, whatever the mechanism is that potentially these, these uh, whether it's like gas clouds collapsing uh, directly into black hole, into a seed black holes, or you know, small, you know, stellar mass black holes merging and forming eventually supermassive black holes. Whatever, whatever this process is, that at some point they have to travel through this intermediate mass black hole range to to, to reach the supermassive black hole range. And so, one thing, one interesting thing we can do with this project is try to find galaxies that potentially harbor intermediate mass black holes in their nuclei. And if we are able to do that, maybe we can try to understand why the, the black hole in that galaxy has not reached supermassive status. 
what is different about this galaxy compared to basically every other galaxy that makes the environment for this black hole different and that it hasn't reached supermassive status. So, so this project, so one of the, one of the outcomes from this project is we can, uh, we can determine black hole masses for basically, you know, as many galaxies as we want to look at, as many spiral galaxies as we want to look at, but potentially we could try to find intermediate mass black hole candidates and then go back and actually uh, use telescope uh, data. Like we could actually take telescope time to, to individually measure those black hole masses and confirm that they are indeed intermediate mass black holes and then try to figure out what's the correlation. Like how, why are these intermediate mass? What, what, ha what has happened to this galaxy that's different from other galaxies? Um, so that's just one implication that we could do with this, with, with measuring these spiral arms of these galaxies. Um, okay, so, so let, me, let me just get right into it. So the way the project works is the, the project is basically ask you two questions. One is to identify the galaxy that, that we're showing you. Um, and what we're doing is, so basically every galaxy that we're showing you, we think should be a spiral galaxy. So we've taken this data from Galaxy Zoo where people have already classified these galaxies. And we've pulled out everything that, we pulled out a bunch of galaxies that have been classified as spiral. But what we've noticed is that some of them, some of the classifications aren't actually right. Um, and so what we need you to do is actually reclassify them. And just, just to confirm that it is a spiral galaxy. And what we've found so far is that really most of them are spiral galaxies. Really about 95% of them are spiral galaxies. There are only 5% so far about that really aren't spiral galaxies. Um, so when, when you go through this identification procedure, you know, don't be surprised if, you're, if you keep saying, okay, this is, this is a spiral, this is a spiral, why, why are you asking me this? Uh, but most of them will be spiral galaxies. But the way we, the way we worded it is uh, you're gonna be shown a picture of a galaxy uh, and it's, the galaxy should be centered in the image. And then it's gonna ask you, is it a smooth or merging galaxy or is it a structured and not merging galaxy? And basically what that means is if it's structured and not merging, it basically means it's a non-interacting spiral galaxy. If it's smooth, it's you know like an elliptical galaxy. Or if it's merging, then it's maybe a spiral galaxy that is significantly distorted. Like the arms are kind of thrown all over the place. It's, it's not really symmetric in, in a broad sense. It just, it, it looks weird. Uh, and it doesn't look like a, a normal, like a normal kind of spiral galaxy. Um, and so, so we basically have you break it out into those two things. And, and if you say it's a structured and not merging galaxy, then we ask you to trace the arms in that galaxy. And then what we do is we aggregate everybody's tracings, throw away the image, and then measure the tracings and figure out, figure out how tightly wound the arms are. But if you, if you determine it's a smooth or merging galaxy, then we, we, you, don't, you don't do anything else with that galaxy. We just, we just show you another galaxy and ask you, ask you the same question again. So, so what I have is a, a couple poll questions where I, I'm showing you pictures of galaxies, and I just want to get, you know, kind of get you get used to seeing seeing really easy examples of of galaxies. Um, so, oh, let me see here. Oh, there, oh, shoot! I kind of gave it away. All right. Well, this one's easy though. So, in, in this case, this is this is the galaxy, and you can see that the galaxy. So, here's the center. Here's the galaxy in the center of the image. And, and now it's just asking you, is this a structured and, and not merging galaxy or is this a smooth and merging galaxy? And so what do you think? Is it, is it either smooth or merging or is it structured and not merging? We have the votes coming in so far, 100% for structured and not merging. Yeah, because I think I gave away the answer though too. But yeah, this is a really good example. This is a really good example of a, of a basically a, a non-interacting spiral galaxy. And this is like the perfect case really. So. Uh, don't expect to see a lot of these, uh, but yeah, this, that's right. So this is a structured and not merging galaxy. If we move on to the next one, we'll get the poll for the next one. Oh wait, I guess I have to close my poll window. And so the next one is so here's an image, and again, this was classified as a spiral galaxy, but. Do you think it is a structured and not merging galaxy, or do you think it's a, a smooth or merging galaxy? And I actually don't have the, the poll window up, so I don't know if it's taking uh, Let me relaunch it. OK. And we are launching. OK, yeah, now I see it. I guess we'll give it a second. Ooh, we have one dissenter for structured and not merging. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, well, I think 
So yeah. So okay. So oh, so two people. Yeah. So uh, so as it's actually majority rule. Uh, so this is actually. Oops, let me click back to my window. So this is actually a, a merging galaxy. So you can see the reason why we consider it merging is because the structure isn't very regular. So it's it's actually there's not it's not a lot of symmetry to this galaxy. So this is actually a galaxy that probably merged with another galaxy and is throwing stars all over the place. So uh, so really this, uh, the the merging classification is actually correct. So you should have picked should have picked A smoother merging. We'll go do one more. And so, so again, so here's another another example of a spiral gal or what was classified as a spiral galaxy. And so we're looking we're looking at the galaxy in the center, but again, the question is is this is this not merging with another galaxy? Is it structured and not merging? So you, can you see structure in it, and does it look like it's not merging with another galaxy, or is it smooth or or merging with another galaxy? So, do we have the do we have the numbers in? Yes, we have ninety two percent for smooth or merging. Yep. Uh, so that's right. Yeah. So this you could see here that this there seems to be a weird asymmetry right here. That's probably another galaxy right here. So this is actually a merging galaxy. All right. So the last one, the last one's going to be tricky. So uh, so this is the image, and this was classified as a spiral galaxy. Uh, but you're uh, trying to identify the galaxy in the center of the image. So is the galaxy in the center of the image, is that smooth or merging? Or is it structured and not merging? All right, we're at 33% smooth or merging. So I'll end the polling. OK. And uh, we'll share yeah. results. Yeah, so it's actually it's actually smooth. So the issue is is that this galaxy is not the center galaxy. This is the center galaxy right here. Uh, so this was actually so a lot of people in Galaxy Zoo actually classified this as a spiral galaxy, but that's not actually the case. They were the the object that they were trying to identify was this object right here, which to me it looks like an elliptical galaxy, but maybe it's a supernova in this in the arm of this galaxy. But in either case, it's it's not the object in the center of this image. Uh, so this is this is actually this is actually should not be a structured and not merging vote. Uh, so this is actually a tricky one. Um, and so sometimes, I mean, this is this is rare. This this rarely happens, but this uh, this does pop up occasionally. Uh, and so the final case then. So if you basically if you pick structured and not merging for for a galaxy, the next part is basically just tracing out the visible spiral structure you see. And what you do is you you basically uh, you know, point to point, click along and uh, click along an arm that you see, and when you're done, you just pick a different color, and then you click along that arm. Um, but so let me let me actually take you. Uh, let me take you to the actual website. And so, are, uh, can you guys see my uh, my web page here? Mm -hmm. We can see it. Okay. All right. So so this is uh, so if you go to uh, and everybody can just join in right now if you want. So basically, if you go to scistarter.org slash spiral graph, um, it'll take you to this page. And if you click to visit the project's website, so a little blue button down here, it will then uh, navigate to Zooniverse where the project is hosted. And so this will pop up. And you can either click, uh, so there's learn more. There's like all kinds of extra information on here. If you're, if you're interested, you can read more about it. We have some preliminary results see pictures of the team, things like that. Uh, you can either click, uh, click learn more or get started, or you could click classify up here. Either, either one works. So we're going to click, click get started. And so it'll load. And in my case, so it's going to show you a random galaxy. And in my case, this is, a, this is the galaxy that's showing me. Uh, and here's the question. And it's basically a pretty detailed question of just what I explained. Um, and uh, so it's asking you, is it smooth or merging and structured and not merging? And so there are different things you can do. Like if, you, if the galaxy is small, you can zoom in, you can zoom out. 
uh, do not pan left to right. Uh, you, can, um, you can invert the color of the image, which is sometimes useful. Uh, I, I tend to like looking at, looking at the inverse for a while, but then my eyes get too used to it. So then I switch back to, to the normal view. Uh, so basically for me, it's like every, every five galaxies or so I keep flipping back and forth because my eyes get too used to it. Um, but yeah, so like in this case, okay, so now it's asking me, is this, is this galaxy in the center? Is this a smooth emerging galaxy or is this a structured and not merging? And in my opinion, I'm going to say this is a structured and not merging galaxy because it looks fairly regular. Uh, you know, it's, there's not any kind of weird, like weird craziness going on with this galaxy. It looks pretty well structured, looks, uh, you know, uh, pretty re fairly regular, and then you click next. And then it gives you uh, like all these different options for colors, uh, and you have to pick at least one and draw at least one. And so I'm gonna pick uh, the yellow color, and you just wanna trace out the visible spiral structure that you see. And so here's one arm, and then I'm gonna click another color, and then here's another arm right here. And then I think I see maybe a third arm right here. And so what you don't wanna do, so this, this galaxy, uh, so this galaxy actually right here has uh, what's known as an inner ring. And so you don't, wanna, you don't wanna trace out the inner ring. You don't wanna trace out the bar if it has one. You don't wanna, you don't wanna trace out the bulge. Uh, you just wanna trace out the arm structure that you see. And I mean, don't worry about it if you, if you, you know, you just trace what, trace the arm structure that you're comfortable with seeing. I mean, it may not, it may not go all the way down into the, to the inner ring. It may not go all the way down to the bar. It may not go all the way down to the bulge. They may just be arm segments. And so just trace out what you're, what you feel comfortable with saying that, yes, this is, this is a spiral arm. And when you're done, you just click down here and you can either click uh, done and talk. So if you want to, if you want to say something about it, like, you know, there's a weird thing in this image or, uh, I've seen this before somewhere or something like that. Uh, or you could just click done and then it'll just show you the next galaxy. And that, that's basically it. So, I mean, like we did this in, I mean, me talking through it, we did this in like a minute. Uh, so you could, you could blast through a bunch of galaxies like in half an hour. You could do probably do 30 galaxies in, in half an hour um, if you're really good at it. But the thing is like some of these, some of these are difficult. Um, like this one, this one's a weird one. And if, so if you're not comfortable with doing this one, you can always just refresh the page and it'll just show you another random galaxy. And maybe it's one, one you're more comfortable with. Uh, and so you can just keep going and just go all the way through it. But what I'd recommend though is, uh, is if you don't have a Zooniverse account either, uh, what I'd recommend is that you, you uh, log in and you create, you create, account, create an account so that way we can attribute, uh, you know, we, can, we can attribute you know, your classifications to, uh, to, you know, to the project because you know, we, want, we wanna give credit to people who are, who are uh, really helping. And uh, so one thing that we do that we do is uh, we have a monthly leaderboard. Uh, so we try to we try to recognize people every month who, who have contributed a lot to the project. So in March we've had um, we had a bunch of people work really hard. And so uh, last month in March the the top person did 545 classifications, which is astounding. Uh, that's like the best we've ever had. So that's ridiculous. Uh, but yeah, so if you're you know if you're if you're really into it. You know, you'll you'll be recognized. So, um, but yeah, uh, and we appreciate it. And and the thing is, is uh, actually this morning we just finished our first uh, set of a thousand galaxies. And so I actually had to upload the the next set of a thousand. So so right now we only have seventy three classifications and zero completed subjects out of a thousand. But that's just because we we just started we just started a new batch. Uh, and so I'm actually really excited to see what see what the the data is that that we that we just completed. So I'm. I'm going to try to start analyzing that uh, next week. So I'm really excited about that. But yeah, so I'm just going to leave it there. And if you guys have questions, I'm really happy to answer any anything that you want to talk about. Excellent. Thank you so much, Patrick. That's fantastic and takes us out into the deep universe with citizen science as well. I just wanted to reiterate for everyone as well as a reminder, all of the projects we featured here today can be found at scistarter.org slash astronomy mag. I encourage you to sign up for the project so you can get involved um, during this event and afterward. And then we'd like to give you, uh, before I think we ask and, and see if, if we covered everything, is there anything that any of our scientist panelists want to add as an addendum? But we also want to do a final poll. 
Um, here's our last poll for the participants, if we can. Did you participate in any of the projects during this live event? If not, would you consider getting involved in one of the citizen science projects we featured here today? We'd like to hear your live poll on that, and then I'll throw it back for some closing comments from our project scientists. Did you participate in any of these during this live event? And would you like to participate in these citizen science activities through SciStarter? Let us know what you think about that. All right, we got about, I'm gonna end the poll in three, two, last chance, one, and poll, share results. All right, so we've got some willing participants for the future and some people who did it during the event. That's great. Thank you, everyone, for watching today. I wonder if you might have any final thoughts, Connie, Sten, and Patrick, that you'd like to sign off with, any reminders about the projects, about websites, anything else you'd like to say to these great folks? Yeah, um, I have a, a comment. I was wondering if people, this was actually one of our poll questions, I think it was number four, uh, um, Caroline. Uh, I was wondering if people from a month ago, if they could tell a difference in their night sky from a month ago, as opposed to like say tonight uh, and how bright or how dark their night sky is, because um, I think that has changed for many people. And I think this is a, uh, the silver lining to the cloud to actually take advantage of the situation that we're in and to keep looking up. Thank you very much. I, I think what I'd like to add is, um, you know, the night sky is, is a precious resource, um, you know, and if you pollute it because you don't use proper lighting on the ground, uh, that's to the detriment of uh, future people that would like an uncluttered view of, of the heavens. And if you put satellites into orbits and you don't design the satellites to be non-invasive, then you wind up with uh, a cluttered sky no matter what the light pollution level is. So it's a precious resource that we have to learn how to take better care of before it's too late. Yeah, and uh, I just wanna say like, thank thankfully all of my data has already been taking, taken uh, because man, yeah, like the, the, these other two citizen science projects, it's, you know, those, they're really important. And honestly, you know, collecting more data from the ground in, in, the, in the case where, you know, sky brightness is getting, getting brighter and, and, you know, we're getting all these satellite const constellations being launched into space. I mean, it's just gonna make things harder. So th thankfully my data already exists. So I don't have to, I don't have to worry about that yet. And there um, we've got results. 40% on, I'm sorry, Caroline. Oh, I thought it was Caroline. It was Connie, maybe. Go ahead. No, please. No, I just wanted to make another point that if, if we don't do something now, future generations are not going to enjoy the night sky that, say, our grandparents enjoyed. Uh, that whole um, cultural heritage will be lost forever. So um, it, it would be really great for people to get more yeah. active in trying to. Um, reduce the yeah. amount of light pollution we have and preserve what we have. Uh, the, the, the scary thing is that future generations are not going to enjoy the sky that we currently observe, if you can yeah. imagine what that means. <laughs> so let's get back to the poll. Go ahead, David. So we've got 40% on it's darker uh, presently, 60% uh, brighter than a month ago, and, and that's the split. Um, so that's a very interesting result there. Um, but we know that we need darker night skies, fewer bothersome satellites for both professional and amateur astronomy. And lots of, we don't have all the 100 billion galaxies classified well yet. So there's a lot of work to do in all of these areas. We know that we enjoy nature and science and the night sky and astronomy. It's been a great pleasure to be with you three today. Remember to get involved and get engaged with Astronomy Magazine and astronomy.com and with SciStarter and SciStarter.org. Dave Eicher saying uh, thank you very much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. We look forward to doing this again very soon. Take thank care you. out there. Be safe.
All right, and on that, we're going to, um, we have lots of uh, great feedback in the chat from everyone. I'll make sure to share the chat transcript with our panelists afterwards. And for others, please stay tuned. In the coming days, um, we'll be posting a recording on the SciStarter blog. You can also find it shared to um, Astronomy's and SciStarter's Facebook page from our watch party we did inside the Facebook event that we co-hosted. So thank you so much again to everyone. And um, are we good to sign off? Good to sign off. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. And um, I hope you enjoy Citizen Science Month. And thank you to David for hosting us. Thank you so much for having us. We, we really enjoyed it today. Fantastic.